Well, good morning, everybody. I want to thank you so much for joining us on this morning for our Live and Well Communities February Learning Community Session. This is our second one of this brand new year. And we wanted to um, talk about achieving Black wellness by eliminating health disparities in this month of Black history, where we also celebrate uh, Black heritage. And our guests for uh, this session uh, was scheduled to be Councilwoman Melissa Robinson, president of the Black Health Care Coalition. I'm still waiting for Melissa to join us, but I want to really honor your time that you gathered here. And so we're going to still have a conversation. Uh, so what we are so grateful for at Alive and Well is our funders who help make this possible. And we couldn't do these learning sessions and the work that we do without the support of Reach Healthcare Foundation, Community Mental Health Fund, Health Forward Foundation, they are the ones that make this work possible uh, in the Kansas City area. So we're so grateful for uh, their work. The reason why we thought it was so important to have this conversation this month is as we work to eliminate disparities for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, we know that one reason that persons of color Blacks, Indigenous persons don't get help is because of a history of mistrust uh, within the medical system. Uh, that distrust uh, is not only with clinicians or caregivers, but also even with medical researchers. Uh, and this mistrust stems from structural as well as systematic factors that span centuries. And so we know that in order for us to truly go out and do this good work, we have to talk about what has happened in the past in order for us to learn from those past mistakes and move forward into our, our future. We're gonna ask those of you who may not have muted your microphones to do so if you would. Uh, I'm gonna uh, actually make this something where we're going to learn together. Um, and so I'm gonna be asking some questions. I would love for you to unmute at that point in time and answer those questions there. but what we truly believe will help us improve black health and wellness is one having a unified community unified effort that does several things the first one is to listen to one another to hear the stories uh, of those persons who have been mistreated or have not received the care that was appropriate for them in the healthcare system so it begins with listening it begins with also caring and having compassion for those. But beyond listening, caring, and having compassion, it also uh, moves us to action. Um, and hopefully that action begins with us becoming advocates for those individuals and for uh, ourselves. And so we know that one of the things that we need to do is learn how to find out what resources are there that are present for us to achieve that wellness for us to live our best holistic and fulfilling lives. And so um, I really want to jump into this conversation. I had the uh, pleasure of hosting a listening session uh, for um, the Kansas University Medical Center. Um, they're doing a project, uh, listening project, uh, community project, and this project is really geared around listening to persons of color stories of how um, the healthcare system uh, has been embedded uh, with structural racism. And the goal uh, of these listening sessions was for us to hear stories from individuals who had been impacted by those experiences within the healthcare system. One of the stories that I heard was from a gentleman who had been diagnosed with stage four cancer, who was seeking help within the system and who was acknowledged in the pain that he was experiencing and yet was not being taken serious about the pain uh, that he uh, was experiencing. Uh, and it's as if somehow he was making up his pain threshold in an effort to somehow just get drugs. Um, and hearing those stories of persons who went into healthcare systems and who voice was not listened to fully, who were not heard, who, who were made to believe that they were making things up, 
those kind of stories were stories that were heart wrenching to me and stories where it just reinvigorated in me the need for us to have conversations about the centuries of neglect, the exploitation, and the abuse of people of color in clinical encounters. Uh, and so we wanted to feature an organization that was doing that work of advocacy, that work of help promotion uh, this month. And so once again, a Councilwoman uh, Robinson may join us on the call. Once again, I wanted to honor your time and I wanted us to get this conversation started. So what I believe with regards to changing systems is that it begins with awareness. And so uh, there's a quote that I love uh, <clears throat> to, uh, a quote that I love to share with you all with regards to change. And that quote is, the first step toward change is awareness. And the second step is acceptance. And so while most definitely we wanna use this as an opportunity to bring awareness, we know that change happens with both not only awareness, but acceptance. Uh, and so I think one of the key things that we wanna make sure that we do is move from not just raising awareness that these things are challenges and problems, but also that being acceptance within, accepted within the systems of care and then begin to move toward change. So let me begin uh, by asking a question to our audience. What steps are your organizations taking to begin to eliminate, eliminate health disparities? Or what kind of steps do you think should be taken to eliminate health disparities in regards to Blacks, persons of color, Indigenous persons? Does anybody want to share with us what steps are you taking to eliminate health disparities within your systems of care, within your organizations, or what steps do you believe could be taken? Let's have a dialogue, let's have a conversation. And please, if you do decide to share, feel free to uh, share your name uh, with us. Also, feel free also to use a chat feed as a way also to share with us also your comments. Y'all very quiet on this morning. I think y'all came just to listen and didn't come to talk. Is that true? Anybody want to speak up? And I'll, share? I'll jump in. Thank you, Chris. My I appreciate is, you. My name is Chris Hermish. I am a therapist in private practice. Uh, I have worked in community mental health in the past as well and participated uh, with this wonderful community in the past as well. Anyway, in individual therapy, it's a small example, but just to get it rolling, uh, I maintain a sliding fee, uh, fee scale. Uh, so depending upon my client's ability to pay, and it's a pretty broad range. So if I, and I work with people across the spectrum of income abilities uh, and utilize the people who can pay more to help support the people who can't pay more and dip well below my scale at times when needed. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, for sharing. We know that one of the major barriers for a person seeking treatment is affordability of care. Um, not only affordability of care, but access of care. And so we know that just by making those small adjustments in fee scales can be a major way of providing access of care to persons. Chris, thank you so much for getting us started. Uh, I'm going to share with you all a project that Lavin Wall is working on uh, soon with regards to our diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and accessibility from a trauma-informed approach. I'm going to share with you all that project, and that's our effort to ensure that we have organizations and communities that are looking at how they are looking at diversity and equity and inclusion from a trauma-informed lens. I'm going to share with you all that in a moment, but I want to hear from others uh, if you mind sharing about what you all are doing to eliminate health disparities within your organization, uh, within your community.
guess I'll say something. Um, my name's Dan. I'm with BJC. One of the things BJC does is prides ourselves on diversity um, as shelter outreach. Uh, we also assist people finding uh, insurance like Medicare, Medicaid, uh, making sure they're able to support themselves medically, because I think that's one of the issues is people aren't aware of how to get insurance to cover their medical needs. Thank you so much for sharing um, that with us also. You know, one of the key things um, is, once again, we talk about, we're talking about access, talking about availability of service, so forth. Uh, does anybody uh, here uh, wanna share with us, what efforts are you making to deal with the stigma around uh, persons seeking care, whether that be mental health care or physical health care? We know that a lot of persons that they could actually, if they uh, trust the system, begin to deal with some comorbidities and different illnesses like diabetes, hypertension, um, uh, mental health challenges, if they would only seek help early. Uh, so prevention, early intervention, all those things are so imperative for folks to avoid chronic illness. But we know that the stigma within the healthcare system often, uh, or stigma of the healthcare system, if you even if you would, prevents persons from seeking that help. Uh, what are you all doing? Anybody wanna share what you all are doing to, to work with um, BIPOC communities to deal with that stigma? I'd love to take a second to share. Um, I am from, my name is Lena. I'm from Altruism Media, um, which is in Kansas City, Missouri. Because our maternal mortality rate is so high um, and infant mortality rate, both for black um, birthing people and infants, we are taking a new approach to um, basically assessing all kinds of health, social determinants of health, preventive care, um, all things like that from pregnancy through a year postpartum. So when we get connected to clients, um, we do have an emphasis on black and Hispanic populations just because those are facing the highest mortality rates. Um, and so we do an assessment of not only their healthcare needs, but their mental health, their, um, you know, if they're at risk for diabetes or gestational diabetes, um, and then as uh, social determinants of health as well. So can they keep their lights on? Do they have food on the table? Are they having trouble paying rent? And we basically connect them to a community health worker and doula so that those two can work as a team to act as case managers, to provide a full continuum of health and social care and it also at the same time relieves the burden off of the patient. So they are not, you know, having to navigate those systems by themselves. They're not having to get connected and do the referral process or the long wait times. We do all that work for them. So just kind of a whole, um, whole person continuum of care approach. Thank you so much for sharing uh, with us. You know, one of the things that we know that oftentimes people are dealing with, um, mistreatment within healthcare systems, um, sometimes suffering, being disregarded. Um, persons often uh, feel as if somehow uh, there have been insults to their dignity, uh, and that has prevented them from pursuing the best care for, for their illnesses. Uh, I, I really want to hear from you. Um, when you think about wellness, holistic wellness, what, what would you consider to be some elements that could make your communities, communities that really look at wellness from a holistic point of view? For instance, I, I have done mental health first aid as a early intervention trainer for the past 15 years as a national trainer. We are really working hard to increase literacy around mental health, but also um, not only that work, working alongside other partners in the community to say, hey, how do we get people to talk about getting prostate exams, uh, persons uh, going in and getting early screenings for diabetes? Um, what, what kind of elements do you think are important for us to continue to promote for this holistic wellness? I hear microphones. Anybody wanna share or jump in?
This is Jessica Welch with Phoenix Family. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, at, at our um, older adult communities that we serve. So we, we have on-site services at affordable housing communities. Um, but one of the things we try to do is kind of get people together in community and then have like a presenter come and talk about, you know, um, like what you mentioned, prostate exams, um, whatever the topic is that, um, you know, where they can learn about it in community with each other, have some food, just kind of also kind of the social isolation prevention. Um, but so really just that social connection, I think is helpful and they can support each other. Um, while they're learning about it and ask questions. So it, it doesn't feel like people are alone when they're trying to navigate those systems, I think has been been helpful. I think that you raise a really important point about uh, Black, about uh, navigating systems and being able to navigate uh, systems and being able to know what care is available in the chat feed um there is a link to a conversation april 15th about creating healthy thriving black families uh conversation on black maternal health thank you brenda for sharing that link i would encourage folks to please uh click that link there that's a link to eventbrite um to be able to support that uh, event around black maternal health i tell you um, you know, wellness um, takes on many different dimensions, and I would love, there's more, um, Brenda, please share, please share information about that if you don't mind. Feel free to unmute yourself. Sure, good morning. Um, I am sharing this uh, information on behalf of the Kansas Birth Equity Network, which is led by one of our board members at REACH, Dr. Sharla Smith. And um, I'll be um, one of the fortunate people that gets to be on a panel with some real leading experts on this issue and um, wanted to just share a few of the ways that um, REACH and I think many other health philanthropies are trying to support um, efforts to increase the health and well-being of uh, Black moms and babies. Um, one of those ways that we do that is through supporting events and convenings like this, but also um, the extension of um, Medicaid benefits postpartum for moms up to 12 months. We've been supporting that in um, Missouri, and I think that looks like it's well on its way to passage, so we're very excited about that and um, similar efforts are taking place and, and actually passed last um, session in, in the Kansas legislature. So I think one of the things that I always encourage folks to think about is the way that policy and policies are being made that impact people of color and the just absolute imperative of civic engagement and voter engagement to be sure that you're represented um, in these very powerful tables that are making decisions that impact all of our communities. And uh, Melissa Robinson is certainly one of those. I'm sorry she can't be with us today, but um, it's really critical that people get engaged at the policy level and make their voices heard or all the work that we do uh, in, in this space can be undermined with the swipe of a pen and a, and a single bill. Brenda, thank you so much for sharing uh, with that. And Absolutely, Melissa Robson is doing that great work, which is why we most definitely were so excited to have her uh, to join us today. But of course, um, we most definitely would schedule Melissa to come back and join us again for a conversation. I think that when we talk about wellness, sometimes we uh, think about wellness from that physical health perspective, as well as think about wellness, even from a mental health perspective. But there are different dimensions of wellness, and I think this is what I want to talk about holistic wellness, wellness in these different dimensions. There are um, different models of wellness. There's eight dimensions of wellness that SAMHSA promotes. This right here has six dimensions of wellness, as you can see, environmental wellness, emotional, um, intellectual, spiritual, social wellness. 
And so I am making a collective effort as a faith leader to ensure that our faith leaders are really engaged in how to ensure that we are approaching folks holistically in uh, wellness approaches. When we think about uh, intellectual awareness, it does begin with these kind of conversations where people increase knowledge about how they can do things that are preventative and early intervention and so forth. Um, and so you all have heard the knowledge is power adage. And so uh, this is why I'm grateful, even though we're not going in the direction that I hope we would go this morning, that we are learning from one another about different ways we can do that. I want to share with you a project that the REACH Healthcare Foundation, that uh, Health Forward and Community Health Fund has graciously helped us uh, support, and that is with Alive and Well, we are launching an initiative, uh, and that initiative, we're calling it our Trauma and DEIBA Healing Eye Workforce Pilot Initiative, and we are really excited about building teams uh, that can be teams that are inclusive as well as healthy teams. We're gonna be hosting a training at the REACH Healthcare Foundation, uh, actually April 3rd through Thursday, April 6th. And we're gonna be hosting a training. And what we're gonna be doing in that training is a total of six different things. One, this is gonna be an interactive experience where one, we're gonna examine systems in which we live and work that perpetuate trauma. We're also going to be talking about how we can assess our own environments for the impact of trauma, as well as discussing strategies for building resilience in people and organizations. And then we're, we're going to be looking at how uh, one can understand their own identities and build stronger relationships uh, with them, with themselves, with regards also their teams. And, and then the last couple things we're gonna be doing is helping folks identify strategies for building an equity center trauma informed team culture. This training is going to have two tracks. One's going to be a leadership track and the other is going to be a trainer trainer track. And so at the end of this training experience, persons will be able to do the trainer trainer track, go back to their organizations and do a two hour trauma informed training. Uh, and then those who go the leadership track will be joining us uh, up to October in monthly meetings to continue to talk about this work that they're doing within their organizations. So that was a mouthful. I'm going to take what I just said and throw it in the chat feed. So uh, this is what we're planning on doing April 3rd through the 6th at the uh, Healthcare Foundation. On the 7th, we have partnered with JD Construction, and we're going to be having our last day of training there at JD Dunn on the 7th uh, of April. And so we are excited about this initiative. We've been working on it for a long time. Teresa has been <laughs> with us on that journey. Others have been with us on that journey to make this happen. Um, and so what I'm going to do is put in the link, uh, in the chat feed, a link uh, to the application for you to apply for this opportunity. Because of the funding from our three entities, we can offer up to 20 scholarships for individuals. Uh, and to date, we have nine applications in. So we have 20 scholarships. We have nine persons who've applied uh, to date. And we're going to be taking these applications up to the end this month. Uh, we'll be getting word out in March, those people who've been accepted to the program. And then we're going to look forward to seeing everybody in April uh, uh, for um, this program here. I am really. Jermaine, um, thank you for sharing this. Um, this is Teresa. Um, I wanted to comment earlier. This is Teresa Cummings. I'm the deputy director at the Community Mental Health Fund. And I wanted to comment on a couple of questions that you asked. Um, the first one being, um, what are we doing to address health equity? Yes. And as a funder, we're not, we don't provide direct care, but what we are doing is training our agencies to um, look at their data differently because agencies can't address what they don't know. And so in looking at their health data that they're collecting, looking at demographic information and different things like that. So um, we work extensively providing technical support to all of the agencies that we fund in the community, which is close to 40 different agencies in Jackson County who deliver um, behavioral health care. 
in looking differently at their information to see where they find disparities happening so that then they can address them. So your um, comment about affecting change is first is the awareness. That is so true. They need to be aware of what's going on within their own, own organizations and accepting that there is, if the data is telling them that there is some disparities going on and then they have an opportunity to affect change. And we are also um, incentivizing our organizations who do in fact make progress towards changes in those areas. So I just wanted to comment on that as from a funder's perspective, how we're looking at that. And then also in the question you asked in regards to you know, how can we better holistically um, care for people? And since we are a, a mental health or behavioral health funder, we're somewhat limited as to what we can fund, but I am pleased to report that our board is shifting a little bit and recognizing, you know, those um, six domain dimensions that you brought up there. There's other ways that people can be well, mentally well, besides therapy or medication, you know, having those spiritual components in their life and physical activity and different things like that. So we're really starting to look at how we fund agencies and what we're funding to ensure that we are taking more of a holistic approach for caring for people. Um, so that's something that, that we're continuing to look at ourselves and how we do things and how we can have an impact in this area. So I'm sorry I didn't comment earlier. I was I was driving and I didn't want to. <laughs> well, listen. First of all, I'm glad that you took care of your safety first. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, I, I want to share with you all uh, a thought from um, the Dalai Lama, uh, and I think it really should flow into all the work that we are doing here collectively. And the quote is simply this. Our prime purpose in this life is to help others. And if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. I, I love that quote um, because there have been so many systems that were supposed to be designed to help people that ended up actually hurting persons. And so when you hear that quote, what comes to mind uh, for you with regards to how can we help others um, versus hurting others? What, what can we do to ensure that we're helping others versus hurting others? Kathy, your microphone went off. I wasn't sure that was a clue you wanted to talk or not. But anybody else want to kind of share with me your thoughts on that? I think the most important thing when we're trying to help and not hurt is asking what that community specifically wants and needs because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what I think is needed if I'm not listening to what they think they need mm -hmm. yeah I think you know that is the importance of not just handing things to persons and thinking that that's what they need but actually asking folks um, and find out what their actual needs are and then empowering them to take action to to be able to get those things that they need i can actually talk for hours and hours and hours i'm i'm a preacher so i can be long with it sometimes uh and, but, you know uh, jermaine i wanted to follow up on her comment um that's so true we need to be asking people and i and i see um a big population that we don't ask questions to enough are our youth. I see so many programs that are developed for youth without youth involvement in developing those programs. And, um, you know, people that have reached out to me to assist them in some of these areas, you know, I ask them, well, have you talked to the kids by which you're wanting to deliver these services to? And I get this look like, oh, wow, no. I haven't, I was like, well, I think you should start with asking them some questions about what would work for them in developing programs that are serving them. And so I think a lot of people kind of discredit the ability of our young people in high school and middle school to inform, inform 
services delivered to them. Yeah, and we don't I, do it enough. Absolutely, we should we should really inquire a person's what works best for them for sure. Well, one of the things that I'm going to put uh, in the uh, chat fee is a evaluation form just for the brief moment we've been together. Your feedback is so very important. And one of the things I always love to give people is back the gift of time. Um, I uh, most definitely want to uh, hear from others who want to share with us. Um, we are looking at having our first in person learning community event in um, March. And uh, we are also um, looking forward to our event in April where we're going to have um, uh, Kiana. Thomas and the President Health Board Foundation, as well as Angie Brown with the St. Louis Regional Health Commission, talk about how their foundations and groups are working toward health equity. So we're excited about our April learning community event. You'll get word about that soon. Uh, and then we're looking forward to doing our in-person event in March uh, in Kansas City. So you all be getting word about those coming up soon. Teresa, you think you want to share something? Yeah, I had a question um, of this group. And when you started, we were talking about um, the mistrust that people of color have within the healthcare system, rightfully so, particularly with the history and the need to you know, listen to those stories and under, understand those stories, et cetera. And I'm just curious as to, you know, at what point do we feel like we can start to somewhat add to that dialogue of positive stories where people have received um, care and what people think about that. Because um, I know there are some, um, me as a, a Mexican woman, you know, I had children young in my um, late teens and early 20s, and I happen to have an African American man as my OBGYN. Um, which I didn't think anything about it until I got older and realized how rare that really was. But, oh my gosh, you know, I was fortunate to have just wonderful prenatal care and a, a great delivery. And I had, um, you know, um, a Mexican a nurse who was a family friend, luckily, that helped care for me in the hospital after I gave birth and you know, taught me all about nursing and all of those kinds of things. So I had a lot of really rich, good experience of other people of color in the healthcare system providing me with care as a young mother. So I'm just curious about, you know, understanding the history and developing that trust, but as part of that developing trust, also telling these positive stories. I would love to share um, what we're doing because we're kind of taking a double-sided approach. So on our client's end, um, because we serve with the intent to improve maternal mortality rates, especially among Black and Hispanic women, um, we educate not only on preventive care, local resources, um, you know, the kind of things to expect that they might encounter throughout their pregnancy and postpartum process, warnings about mental health care and connections to that, um, but we also, as part of that, teach health literacy and how to advocate for yourselves, how to how partners of birthing people can advocate for their partners throughout the birthing process and delivery and postpartum, um, how to navigate healthcare systems um, for both Black populations, but also Hispanic and Spanish-speaking communities um, when that translation kind of barrier can be there. So on the patient side, we're helping with health literacy and empowering um, our clients that we serve to speak up for themselves, to know their patient rights, to call out providers that are, you know, contributing to those disparities, but also to um, kind of show them different op options for care. Um, we employ doulas to communities. Um, that is part of the model along with community health workers, just to show that there's a different way to approach care that uh, might be a better fit for certain populations because of those systems. Um, on the other side, we are also approaching it from a workforce standpoint, because we know that there's, you know, part of improving those barriers and those maternal mortality rates would be to have physicians of color and physicians who come from various backgrounds, rural backgrounds, Spanish speaking, um, things like that. So having that sort of representation in the healthcare workforce. So we are also um, 
working on how to build that pipeline and get people from the community who know the community and can relate to people and know the problems and can address those at the provider and system standpoint and getting them into the doula, the community health worker, the you know provider pipeline. That is great. Uh, and I think it takes that dual approach where we have systems who are saying, listen, call persons out when you are experiencing that. So we can begin to address that head on. Absolutely. Once again, we do apologize for our speaker not being able to make it uh, this morning, but we wanted to still honor your time uh, and have a conversation and we will be sending out notices for our upcoming conversations. So thank you so much for giving us your time this morning and uh, we will give you back 20 whole minutes uh, of your morning. So uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you for... Thank you, Jermaine. This was uh, this was informative in the time that we did have. I appreciate everybody who contributed. And Carla, thank you for providing in the chat feed um, information in the chat feed with regards to the Archer study. So most definitely thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll have this posted on our website and you'll be able to come back to it and share it with others. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.